We are delighted to welcome you to this session of the 15th Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by Dettol Banega Swast India. It is our pleasure to present today each other's stories. Anushka Jasraj, Nisha Susan, Paul McWee, and Sonal Kohli in conversation with Indira Chandrasekhar. The brevity of short fiction, illuminating transformative moments in life, eliminating all that is unnecessary, takes it to the heart of the reader. A session that investigates and celebrates the form and function of the short story. Conversations and contextual readings featuring Indira Chandrasekhar, author of the short story collection, Out of Print, 10 Years, an Anthology of Stories. Paul McWee, director and co-founder of London Short Story Festival. Sonal Kohli, author of the collection, The House Next to the Factory. Anushka Jasraj, author of Principle of Prediction. And Nisha Susan, who has written The Women Who Forgot to Invent Facebook and other stories. Anushka Jasraj. Anushka Jasraj is a writer and educator based in Mumbai. She is a two-time winner of the Asia Regional Commonwealth Short Story Prize in 2012 and 2017. Her debut short story collection, Principles of Predictions, was published by Western Books in 2020. Nisha Susan. Nisha Susan is the author of the short story collection, The Women Who Forgot to Invent Facebook and Other Stories. Her nonfiction deals with ideas of gender, culture, and the internet. In 2021, she wrote a short book called 17 Years and a Pandemic, What Watching Grey's Anatomy Taught Me, and has recently translated K.R. Meera's Kabul from Malayalam, Paul McWee. Paul McWee's short stories have featured in anthologies, journals, and newspapers, as well as on BBC Radio 3, 4, and 5, and Sky Arts. He co-founded the London Short Story Festival and is Associate Director of Word Factory, London, the UK National Organization for Excellence in the Short Story, Sonal Kohli. Sonal Kohli has a master's degree in creative writing from the University of East Anglia, UK. Her first book is titled The House Next to the Factory and her stories have been shortlisted for the Bristol Short Story Prize in 2019 and Fish Short Story Prize 2014. Indira Chandrasekhar. Indira Chandrasekhar is a scientist, fiction writer, literary curator, and the founder and principal editor of Out of Print, one of the primary platforms for short fiction bearing a connection to the Indian subcontinent. Her short stories appear in anthologies and literary journals across the world. Her collection of short stories, Polymorphism, was published by HarperCollins. Please feel free to send in your comments by typing them in the comments section. Do follow our social media handles to get notifications on the upcoming sessions. Please tweet using hashtag Jaipur Literature Festival 2022 and tag at Jaipur Litfest. Ladies and gentlemen, each other's stories. Anushka Jasraj, Nisha Susan, Paul McWee, and Sonal Kohli in conversation with Indira Chandrasekhar. Indira, over to you. Hello, everyone, and greetings to our viewers in the GL JLF cyberspace. We, five writers, are here to discuss the literary form that compels us, the short story. For some inexplicable reason, it's relatively undervalued as a form of writing, but I believe it has the singular ability to cast sharp, crystalline focus on the many complex things that one wishes to examine through writing. Now we're five of us, and even though we write short fiction, I'm sure we each have a lot to say. So in order to use our time well, we'll plunge more or less straight in, but first indulge me with two small things, the structure of the session broadly and a small comment. The structure of the session, we'll have two rounds. In the first, the writers will speak about their work and in the second, their influences in terms of what their other literary and professional engagements are. And if time permits, we'll respond to each other's works, but we'll see how that goes. A small comment, a call of recognition to the fine, fine literary team at Context Books. 
We're recording this session on the day after we've learned with some shock that this stellar publishing house has had the ground pulled out from under it. And their investors have just announced that they're withdrawing. Now, three of us writers on the panel are context book uh, writers. And this is a reminder of how fragile the systems that support the arts are. And so thank you, JLF, for keeping going all these years and providing us with a platform to talk about the craft and rigor that go into writing a short story. Now, this is a festival of letters, but I'm going to break from the alphabetic and go into the linear and the geographic and use a distance measure to select the order uh, in which we go. So, Sonal, if it's all right with you, since you're the furthest from me as I sit here in Bangalore, um, I am going to go with you first. Now, to our viewers, uh, everybody's bio is available on the website. We've probably been announced in as well, and all our lovely achievements have been laid out before you. Um, so I'm just going to say, Sono, that your work has the ability to examine the difficult, complicated, tender, and nuanced ways in which people live their lives. And you're able to kind of recreate recognizable worlds to us. But then what's also interesting is how the balance in those worlds and in, among these characters is buffeted by political and social events. And so I think of my own work, and when I wrote a story called The Perfect Shot, which was inspired, I have to say, by Ram Rehman, the photographer and artist, um, I struggled very much with that aspect, the aspect of the political landscape in which the story was occurring. And in the end, I took what I suppose is a cowardly route, and I just termed that political reality uh, into a kind of uh, imaginary and somewhat generic fictional dystopia. So I am a pay accolade to your ability to create these political landscapes. So what drives your work, especially as you sit so far away from where these realities uh, took place in which you grew up? Uh, thank you, Indra, for such a nice uh, introduction and for reading my work. Thank you also to JLF for providing all of us this platform. It's my first time at JLF and I'm very excited to be here, uh, albeit virtually. Um, uh, I think, uh, um, I mean, I'm uh, very attracted to short story as a form. I think it's beautiful and, and, and very alluring. And um, I've been, uh, uh, I started writing these stories when I was in India and uh, so I was very much in that landscape, in that milieu, but I find that uh, the further I am from it, the more vivid it becomes for me. Mm -hmm. So uh, so in that sense, and it's, it, it's become my way to be part of that landscape that, you know, that land, the people, uh, that atmosphere through my work. So uh, I, I, I don't think, uh, uh, I don't feel that distance, physical distance distances me actually from that place and or from, from the space where my stories arise from. And uh, I found your comment of, you know, saying that the short story uh, brings a sharper focus to, to you know, human, uh, human emotions or the uh, human condition uh, very apt and uh, I, I find that uh, it's something about the short story that allows it to do that and I think uh, it, it might perhaps be uh, the fact that it, it, it needs us to be brief and you know it needs us to be focused and so in order to tell the story of, an, of a human being or of a character or a relationship it really needs us to focus on a certain aspect of that character or relationship and then go into, into it in detail. And I feel that this sort of focus uh, perhaps, uh, you know, helps us uh, see it with more detail, see the, the characters or the relationships with more detail. And I find that when it is well done, it also, it can, you know, be as, as revealing as, as a longer work of, of, you know, as a longer narrative, maybe a novel or, or a, long form nonfiction. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I think uh, looking back, I also realized that in order to tell the whole truth, you don't need to tell the whole story. Mm -hmm. And so that's something uh, that short story allows us. Yeah. Um, 
another thing about you know I, I uh, about the form of the short story I, I just feel that I, I've been I was working on this book for a long time uh, 10 years or more and just so as to you know uh, create a sense of excitement for myself and uh, and you know just to be uh, uh, excited about every new story I tried to do something different with each piece mm -hmm. for example like one story uh, it's a story of two friends two old friends who are old and also old friends and it's set on a veranda uh, on a winter morning and it's entirely in dialogue mm -hmm. uh, another story is set uh, in a colonial bungalow uh, in old Delhi and uh, the bungalow is on the cusp of sale so it's just an evening unfolding in that household and it's sort of tinged with melancholia because they're 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 about to leave their family home and move into an apartment mm -hmm. and uh, yet another story is a story of two brothers who uh, stop at a kebab shop on their way home from their factory and and you know they sit in their car and they eat kebabs and listen to guzzles and they uh, the brothers have built a prosperous partnership but mm -hmm. instead of being a story about dialogue it's more a story about silences and ruminations mm -hmm. and um, and you know uh, almost as a reaction to these three or four stories being very sedentary I then wrote a story about uh, a girl who's who sets out on a quest so she's out in the in the world and it, it's a it's like a personal pilgrimage and mm -hmm. almost like a journey and um, now that when I look back I realize that it's the short story as a form with, uh, which has offers so much variety and versatility and flexibility uh, in the way we tell our stories that allowed me to try so many different uh, ways of telling stories and sort of choose the right way for each story. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. That's really a wonderful uh, beginning to talking about the form and uh, the strength that it offers us. Um, for all of you out there, go and buy the book. I'm going to say that after every author speaks. <laughs> um, I think next in terms of distance is Paul. Um, so Paul, um, welcome virtually to India <laughs> uh, from Ireland. There's an intensity in your writing that's really quite all enveloping. I mean, as a reader, I'm drawn into the world of your characters. And I'm drawn in so completely that everything falls away. And all of me is in this world, a world that often involves children and other voices. And I have a few stories myself with young voices in them that's in my collection, Polymorphism. But I'm not sure I could ever really achieve that complete immersion that you do. So emerging from your stories, I feel like I'm emerging from a, from a cocoon or something. And it's it's sort of like I have to, you know, realign myself with the world. So please tell us about these worlds that you create and um, what the short story means to you. Okay, well, that's lovely. First of all, thank you very much. That's one of the nicest things anyone has ever said, describing my, my stories. And, um, and I love the idea of you being in a cocoon, and uh, which I think now means you're a butterfly, I think, if I think the logic follows through. <laughs> um, but um, I think... Um, for me, that's exactly how it feels when I'm writing. Um, I remember I, was, I spoke to um, um, a writer, a writer, a uh, Pulitzer Prize winning writer called Robert Olin Butler, who 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 won uh, the Pulitzer for his short story collection. And he talks about writing that he he's like an actor. You know, he embodies mm -hmm. um, the character and he writes as if he is that character. And I have to say, I feel very similarly. And I think that that um, process and that intention if you like comes comes into your writing um and and people know that 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 or if they know that you've done it in a sense because they feel like they are that person then especially if it's in the first person and they feel enveloped in, in, in the sort of visceral world and and um i i really love that um transportation device that, uh, um, that that literature is and I think that um, short stories for me and um, there's a great um, uh, I love picking up little phrases as well but A.L. Kennedy is a, a sort of masterful a British short story writer and she says you know um, short stories are small like a bullet is small and I love that in the sense you know um, you know they they are, they can be that impactful and that um, powerful and and that deadly 
um you know and and i think um and also they you know they, they have to you know bullets move fast if these stories are they just come along and they go boof you know and and i think that um you know i like that about a short story because i don't think a novel can do that mm-hmm. i don't think it can't or you know you can't make a bullet last the length of a, <laughs> of a novel you know so it, it and another there's another there's a, another expression where you know a short story is like an arrow in flight you know you know, you know, it comes out, it launches and it follows and then it, it must drop. And I think, um, you know, that feeling, I, I think that that shortness allows an intensity that a novel doesn't because you need peaks and troughs and you need downtime and you need to take someone on a journey and rest and raise them and have light relief and all this. And in the short story, you don't need to do that. You can just hit a note and keep going and um and keep that intensity going so i think that's one of the rare qualities and um and, and one of the qualities that's unique to short story writing mm-hmm. um how's that that's wonderful. <laughs> that's wonderful thank you i uh, i appreciate your point about the deadliness of it because uh people sometimes a publisher once said to me you know you could give us a collection they're light reading that people could just finish a story on a metro and certainly you know a person could finish a story on a metro journey because it's not very long in length Mm -hmm. but then it's such a usual a good short story has such an emotional impact that i Mm -hmm. i could then get out and you know deal with the world just like that or perhaps you could i don't know but uh but that was not the publisher for me (laughs) Yes, I remember uh, just very quickly. I, I remember getting off uh, at Tube in London. I lived in London for 25 years, and I remember having an experience quite like what you've described. And um, when I stepped off the doors, and I was standing at the doors, with, I was just finished it. And as I got off, I felt like everyone was staring at me. I felt like everyone must know what I had just read. Yeah. And I felt exposed and I felt like I needed to get out of there. And I, you know, that I'd been involved in someone's intimate world and that somehow it was, it was like I had invaded the privacy of this character. And, and mm-hmm. it was, um, I just, I, you know, rejoining the world was so bizarre and I didn't feel part of it. And that's, a, and that was just in a space of four or five pages. And that's a really powerful thing. I think that short stories can do. Yes. Yes, I mean, uh, to our readers, I think everyone is, pro- uh, to our viewers, sorry, everyone is, uh, hopefully, all our writers are going to read a little bit from their work uh, in the course of the session. So um, keep yourselves alert. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> hello from Bombay, you're, uh, you're next in line of being close to us. Um, now, your writing has this sort of a vibrancy and an exploratory colorfulness you know it's contrary to Paul because rather than that intense focus it has span you generate almost an exotic texture to the space your characters occupy a texture that's seductive sort of like an adventure and an exciting landscape that your readers drawn into and when I first started writing I strove unsuccessfully for that kind of flavor thinking it would appeal more easily to foreign publishers <laughs> but of course that is not me and I could and um, I would but and it didn't happen but um, I would do a uh, the description of your work a disfavor disfavor if I didn't say that the subjects that you explore though even though you create this colorful landscape have schism and angst and um, and are searching so tell us a little bit about your work <laughs> Um, so thank you for that uh, lovely introduction to my work. Um, I guess I I came into the short story sort of accidentally. Um, I was uh, originally writing short screenplays. I was in film school and then um, I don't know, it just wasn't working when I wrote uh, something as a movie. It was just unsuccessful. And then I took a writing class and suddenly the same stories, like everyone just loved it as a short story for some reason. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it just had to do with the fact that I um, am more in love with language and uh, maybe characters and kind of um, exploring that um, rather than something plot driven. Um, But uh, I also uh, have been wondering why I just clicked with the short story Uh, I mean, it is just part of my aesthetic. I think uh, I tend to be concise sometimes or, uh, you know, if someone like fill up 50,000 words, uh, 
with the same two characters, I wouldn't be able to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but because so I also had someone uh, recently who uh, read my st uh, story collection as part of a book club and they were like, I just don't like short stories, you should write a novel because um, I love, um, you know, the situations you create, but I felt really unfulfilled and I didn't have any closure. And I was like, it's, it's true, I guess. I mean, the short story maybe uh, didn't allow for closure or maybe there's like, um, something for people who want to stay longer with something. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think when Paul described it as a bullet, that also is a certain quality that um, a novel doesn't allow you. Um, and I think short stories worked for me um, early on in writing because it allowed me to experiment. And there's a lot of control that you have in a short story. Uh, and I think when you're writing a novel, that's like a different kind of even emotional skill in terms of like letting go and having something that's kind of outside your control, but being okay with that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's kind of like a practice that I'm now trying out as I, you know, uh, try to write uh, in a different genre. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I, uh, I've, I've been told people have sometimes said to me, oh, you write short stories. Uh, it's just kind of preparatory to a novel and, mm -hmm. and I have to insist, you know, it's a different form. It's just a different skill and a different craft altogether. So, yeah. So good luck with, the, with, the, with other forms, but stay close. Keep the short story close to your heart. <laughs> And Nisha, we, we know each other, of course. Hi. And we Hi. live in the same city, but we haven't met or crossed paths physically for years now, thanks to the realities and restrictions of COVID. Yeah, we'll just blame the pandemic and not, not <laughs> the fact that you've been running a full journal, uh, literary journal, uh, to promote the short story. Uh, well, <laughs> thank you, Nisha. <laughs> yes, and not the fact that we are just lazy and the traffic is horrible. <laughs> yeah, nothing yeah. quite moves like a bullet where we live, right? <laughs> <laughs> I feel especially pleased to be speaking to you about your short fiction because the title story of your collection first appeared in Out of Print. Do you have a copy of the book? Bring it about. <laughs> Actually, we'll all do that at the end. So yes, the women who forgot to invent Facebook, really. <laughs> so the energy in your work is really striking. Your characters are just kind of are, are, are so complex because they're just full of confidence and self-awareness and hope and yet a vulnerability as if they know they're the queens of where they are, but yet they don't quite fit, you know, and they, they, they know that. They know that and they have to, they have to figure it out. So there's a kind of inherent tragedy in that, in that, in that aspect of your work. And um, your characters, they just come into the story with all that burst of themselves. And yet, you know, you know all along, oh, where are they? Who are they? Kind of is, is it the essence of it. So tell us about your writing. And um, yes. <laughs> so um, I often describe my writing as a sort of substitute for being an obnoxious party guest. Um, I, I am the ancient mariner in some way, you know, I'm always looking to like catch people and tell them something, uh, some long and involved story, which is entertaining to me. Um, but uh, I try to sort of um, assault humanity less by putting that into the writing. So most of my writing is, is, does have that quality of wanting to tell you a story really quickly before you run away to eat something at uh, the corner, right? So um, sometimes it is also uh, written very fast. I actually, one of the stories in this collection, this uh, story called The Singer and the Prince is something that I wrote on a metro ride. Uh, I was on the way to a writer's group meeting and it was my turn to write. I had a job, I lived very far away. So I, rather than turn up without a story for at the group, I wrote the story on the metro ride. And of course you come back 
to it but the the thing that i enjoy the most well the two things that i enjoy the most about the short story is one it um it allows you to capture a full burst of energy as a writer and you just like go at the first draft with like as much joy as possible and then maybe you tweak it or fix it or maybe you chuck it out and rewrite it whatever but i like i like that i i like like it's like having a really really quick affair as opposed to some very long tantric sex thing of 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 novel which i i i mean i feel like we must leave to sting and whoever else um i like i like the idea that you can just be satisfied quickly as a writer the other thing that i like about short stories is i actually think of it as a very very generous and exp- expansive kind of space i don't feel like it's restrictive i don't feel like it's limited i don't feel like it's brief i feel like the kind of stories i enjoy reading and writing is like a big baggy kind of space i i actually want the reader to feel like they got their full full everything that full experience by having read the story i don't want them to feel like they just got a like a facet of somebody's personality or the story and you know i was reading anushka's uh, one of anushka's stories earlier today and i just felt like you do plunge into a full world and then you leave the story and you feel like you know i learned a lot of this world like and i learned a lot about all kinds of people and i don't feel like oh i wish it was more i don't wish like it was a novella or a, a dance drama in sanskrit or any of those things so that that really is the feeling that i like best about short stories like i think elif batman had a um, sort of essay in n+1 at one point after looking at um, two volumes of Amer- best of american short stories and she complained bitterly in a elif batman sort of way about why can't people be less precise and why can't people like make i'm paraphrasing badly make less diamond like short stories than just more baggy short stories and i was like yes elif i agree with you <laughs> like i want to like stuff everything into my short story i mean i might be dead tomorrow morning so i have no plan of writing this novel but my short story you know take it enjoy it <laughs> so that's that's generally my approach how oh, wonderful they might have a lot in them and everything happening but they're pretty sharp i can tell you <laughs> so Thank they might be baggy but that bag has impact <laughs> yeah so well it's my turn to talk about my own short fiction and so i'm going to start with uh, actually just t- talking about my collection which came out some years ago uh, because um, i have other stories as well but it's easier and um, so my work is sort of um, influenced very much by the fact that i uh, was a scientist i sort of feel somehow i'm still a scientist in some ways in the way i think and structure and organize myself um but i'm also a writer and i'm you know one is just i'm so influenced also by by um family stories and stories that seem like a uh, oh sweet lovely windows into a world of the past but often carry really really cruel sad sort of aspects to the lives of people often of women but of of people in general so um i'm just going to instead of talking more about myself i'm just going to plunge in and read a little bit it's a an excerpt from a story called the embryotic so this is uh, oh sorry there we go polymorphism i know it's mirror uh, flipped but i'm um, sorry about that and i'm reading from a story called the embryotic um and i'm just going to read little excerpts and then leave you with that the conversation centered around the achievements of the children other people's children of course and my mother-in-law stared at me significantly my husband was gone i was living in my maternal home and the connection between our families could have been severed but the complexities in our bloodlines meant that my mother-in-law was a cousin of my mother and was perforce invited to visit during family events and visit she always did because any child i produced would carry my husband's family name and she wanted to be sure to lay claim to it unless of course i attracted another man in marriage as my mother hoped i would by parading me in ridiculous outfits but skip ahead if i couldn't fulfill my purpose and bear children i had to at least help around the house i had been told and i was assigned to work in the kitchen 
after my family asked the cook, Girija, to leave when the boil on her hand grew as large as a plum. Not one of those fruit that are small, thin-skinned and yellow with melting flesh and veined fragility, but a robust, dark, purple-red variety from the hills of the Punjab, tight and dense with a generous circumference. When the bump had first appeared on Girija's hand, we ignored it, thinking it was an aggressive insect bite, but then soon she was asked to leave. One afternoon, I went to see Girija. Her hand looked like an inflated balloon. She sat cross-legged on a small stool, her hand resting palm down on her knee. The smooth, thickened red bubble seemed almost to pulsate. I stared at it, fascinated. Girija looked resigned as if she were getting accustomed to being an object of curiosity. Have you seen a doctor? Girija shook her head. Rathmi brought me some herb oil from the village. She applies it for me every day. The thick green-brown fluid in the reused old monk bottle near the stove looked foul. Let me take you to Dr. Sheshadri, I said. Dr. Sheshadri's waiting room was packed. But I managed to get her in. And then I'll skip ahead again and um, read to when the doctor lances her boil. <laughs> Over Girija's hysteria, I watched while the fluid level in the open lesion went down. It was quite magical. The skin on her hand crumpled and fell back like the petals of some dark exotic flower to reveal a minuscule creature curled up on a dewdrop-like bubble of thick shimmering liquid. Even Girija fell still, and as we looked at its perfection together, I felt a great tenderness rise within me. I'll stop there. So the story goes on and on. I'm sorry I read such sort of some ghastly kind of story, but <laughs> ghastly descriptions. But anyway, so that's kind of my short fiction, and it isn't always all like that, but I have uh, stories that are influenced somehow by this idea of the magic of life, you know, of molecules somehow coming together and then learning to reproduce. So that's what interests me sometimes. Um, okay, so well, I think we'll sort of uh, wander forwards and um, run through all of you and speak about uh, what, what the other things you do in literature and or in, in your professional lives and how that really influences the way you think about your writing. And of course, please do read as well. It would be really a pleasure. Okay, um, shall we go in the same order? Sonal, do you want to go first? Yes, sure. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, I, uh, I, I have two young children. And uh, so I, in the last few years, I've started to think of myself as, you know, a full-time mother and a part-time writer. Mm -hmm. I write uh, only in the mornings when my kids are still in bed. And, so, and, you know, that leads me to spend the rest of the day with them. And uh, over the years, I've started to really, you know, enjoy and love this balance between mental and physical work. I've, I feel that, uh, you know, the, 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 it's sort of uh, uh, just this, uh, just being with them the whole day. It's, uh, it's tiring, but it's also innovating in the way and it makes... In, in its own way, it makes writing more attractive to me. It, it, it then becomes my oasis. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I, uh, it, uh, that's my, uh, you know, professional and personal life balance. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, in the book, there's, there's, a, there's an artist uh, who has a five-year-old son. And uh, uh, so uh, he, he uh, in the span of the story, he's in Paris on a self-guided residency. And he's sharing the apartment with a woman who's there from India and I thought maybe I could uh, read an excerpt yes. from in there which ties in a little bit with our discussion about uh, work and life balance. Mm -hmm. uh, so here goes. Most mornings Kavya wakes up to find David at the easel, one arm behind his back, patiently painting green dot after green dot, some light, some dark, some translucent, some dense, 
When she looks in from the kitchen, the green molecules seem to shift like the wind, like a placid sea. This will be David's first solo show in 10 years, and he's pleased it is with an important London gallery. He lives in Sheffield, where his wife is a lawyer, and he stays at home to look after Theo. He paints in the mornings while the house is still sleeping and rain falls outside the attic window. For some reason, Kavya has come to think of Sheffield as a town of frequent rains and thunderstorms. She imagines David and Theo making paper boats all day long and setting them sail in rivulets outside the house. Over a Saturday breakfast of toast, tomatoes and cheese, she learns that he used to paint self-portraits in oil, but following Theo's birth transitioned to spontaneous patterns of lines, grids and dots. The kettle is being stubborn and David is at the hog tweaking the regulator. Theo's brought playfulness into my life. I mean, it's just marvelous sometimes to watch him build a tower of Legos, then knock it down and instantly start building again. Piano notes waft in through the French windows, the morning class at Scola Cantorum reaching its zenith. More and more, it makes me wonder if everything is just play, our jobs, the things we do, my art. He looks over his shoulder at Kavya and adds, maybe even all of life, all existence. Do you know about Leela? She asks. He thinks, then shakes his head. Leela is the concept of divine play. She joins him at the hob. She taps the kettle. It holds that God created the world just for the joy of creation. God created it out of bliss, for bliss. She moves the kettle to a different hot plate, but sometimes that helps. David turns on the regulator. This perverse kettle, however, is the very opposite of bliss. She quips. David laughs. His silver chain, his crooked nose, his paint marked t-shirt. Kavya feels a longing, though not for him alone, but his life, his work, his love for his son, and how it all fulfills him. The green dots multiply over the next week to cover the huge canvas. Alain. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sonal. Paul, I know that you're much involved with uh, short story in different ways. So why don't you share that with us and how it impacts your work? When I was in London, I uh, sort of joined an organization called Word Factory, which was a live short story event. And they had four writers read a short story over the course of an evening. And then it would end with a big debate on short stories. So this was a monthly thing and I just got to learn so much about writing and so much about hearing from hearing work read rather than reading it myself and mm. and also how different authors uh you know worked with that challenge of translating their their work into something um oral and you know and uh that was a really fascinating experience and I I've subsequently you know been writing for the radio and I think that was a great um, learning experience working with the live uh the live events um and listening to all those uh, intelligence authors uh, discuss their craft as well and then I co-founded and I was the director of, of uh, London Short Story Festival. We had maybe 80 writers from all around the world come and we had everyone from Booker Prize winners to Pulitzer Prize winners to BBC National Short Story Award winners and these just, you know, people at the top of their profession, you know, and listening to them talk about their craft and um, just being around them and it, it just was an incredible experience. And I think just, I think that you can't help but have that feeling to work. It's a bit like when Stephen King says, you know, if you want to be um, a, a good writer, be a good reader, you know, the more you read, you know, and reading outside of your comfort zone and, uh, you know, it all adds to your craft and the tool, all the tools in your toolbox that you have when you come to write yourself. And I think that um, that's the biggest thing that um, influenced me and and helped me become a better writer. Um, it was other writers and, and reading and, and listening to their work. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, most of my my work tends to be we on the dark side, should I say, you know, in that intensity. But this is this. I'm going to read a, a little bit. Uh, this is a, a very, very short, almost flash fiction. And it's, it's slightly more uh, happier than, than usual. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of this. That year, summer lasted 15 minutes. Even for Northern Ireland, that was out of order. <laughs> 
They say here we get four seasons in one day, but on that particular day, we got four seasons in one hour. With no sun before or after, it was a year's worth packed into a quarter hour, and I slept through it. By choice. Wet, bored and cranky, we were squashed into Uncle Tony's Volvo estate car my mummy had borrowed for the day to take us to Carnlock, where Dad's rich cousin Margaret had a caravan. Four seats in the front, back, front seats, back seats and the back back, i.e. the estate's boot, all packed with bodies. The wee ones journeyed with the legs out of the boot, holding the open door with one hand to stop it flying up and themselves out, while waving to cars behind them with their other hands. These were different times. The day trip had been uh, awful. Dark clouds, bulbous with water, spat at us all day long, just above our heads. We played cards inside the caravan instead of playing on the beach, ate egg and onion sandwiches and drank juice till the roof started leaking and we started fighting and we were brought home in punishment. But come on, seven kids up to the high dough, all in one tiny pressure cooker with steam coming off our damp clothes. My parents were lucky it wasn't a crime scene. While the others were packing, I looked out the big window. I used my forearm, forearm to wipe away the condensation. And it might have looked like waving because an arm waved back from the window of the caravan across. He was around my age with dark curly hair, big sticky out ears and round glasses. He looked smart and cool. Just as he smiled at me, I was pulled by the scruff of the neck away from the window and out the door. Pushed into the car, I got my last glimpse of him craning to watch us. Till the very last second. Mm. We drove in the rain, everyone silent with tiredness and dozy from the cradle rocking motion of the car. Even the wee ones gave up waving and tucked their legs in and clicked the boot door shut. In my dream, I held a wafer cone, the ice cream on top melting, pink rivers flowing down onto my hands, giving sticky tickles until I licked each off one by one. He was there. I reached out and he was holding it too. We held it between us, stared at each other as the ice cream melted. The sun's out, said a familiar voice from far away. My eyes opened to a blinding light coming into the car. As I covered my eyes with the crook of my arm, dreaming came back. My arm wasn't across my eyes, it was waving. I saw him again waving back. He had that smile. Like we had a secret no one could understand, not even us. When I woke up again, there was the rain in front of us and we drove into it and I rubbed my eyes wondering if I was still dreaming. But when I looked over my shoulder at the back window, just for a second, I could see with the sun still shone and the dry ground beneath it. My family still laugh and ask, do you remember that summer you slept through? I still say, if I had known that was all the summer we were going to get, I would have stayed awake. It's a good story, but maybe when I'm older still, I might tell him the real one about how I gave up my summer to see that smile again. But for now, I'm good at keeping secrets. <laughs> oh, very nice. Thank you. <laughs> Anushka. <laughs> we'll have to race through a little, but... Uh, yeah, so I'll just uh, read a quick excerpt from a short story called uh, Luminous. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Jaipur and moved to Delhi after completing a master's in linguistics. I graduated top of my class at Jaipur University and was recruited to join the future wreckage committee. There were originally 12 of us in the FWC, newly graduated linguists, environmental scientists, policy specialists, and even an eco-poet. Our task was to gauge the effects of the new light, which was still an intermittent phenomenon. We were also to create a document of recommendations and warnings for future generations. My role was to ensure the language of our document remained translatable across centuries. This requirement, along with the poet's inclusion in our committee, felt ominous. One resorts to poetry when all else fails. The poet, whose name was Susan, read an original poem at each weekly meeting. She remained silent and took notes the rest of the time. We met for three hours every Friday and were otherwise isolated from each other in our labs and offices. Susan's poems usually lamented the loss of something or the other, an elephant species, a dialect from South India, reproductive rights, attention spans, raw cane sugar and cola drinks. Those poems worked word magic during our meetings. 
The presentations, even with their data-heavy bar graphs, were imbued with melancholy. Just once, Susan read a poem that wasn't her own. It was by the 19th century poet Emily Dickinson. Love is the fellow of the resurrection, scooping up the dust and chanting, live. Um, so this was actually written uh, while I was getting a master's in gender studies. And I think uh, I was just like reading and talking about so many things that got like metabolized into the stories I was writing during that period. <laughs> Wonderful. I like that word metabolized. That's, <laughs> that is somehow what happens. It sort of melds into your system. Right. Thank you for that, Nisha. <laughs> Um, I'll read from the title story from my collection, the story that first appeared in uh, the literary journal that Indra runs. The story is called The Women Who Forgot to Invent Facebook. Um, all the stories in this collection has something to do with the internet. And as it happens when it was put together, uh, the first story is about a pre-Facebook pre world. And the last story in the collection ends with a bunch of women working in a large corporation, uh, which resembles Facebook, I suppose. Um, and, and they spend a lot of their time looking at uh, pictures to censor. Anyway, so that's the book. I'm going to read from the first story. Uh, I met Lavanya when I was 19, and then everyone else in the world threw her. When we left college, we still hung out a lot. It was 2001 and we drank a lot. We made friends with strangers. We left jobs after three days because we hated them. We carried small tubes of toothpaste in our rucksacks, brushed our teeth in the narrow loo of the pub to scam our parents and drove on our spindly lunas to our homes at opposite ends of the city. One night, Lavanya's younger brother, Akhil, joined us at Wiki's. We were surprised to find him good company. Akhil was perfect. He was an insider, so we didn't have to behave ourselves. He knew which men we were into, which ones we had slept with, which ones we had considered. Akhil was enough of a social animal that he kept track of the goings and comings in wikis. He was enough of an outsider to our lovely twosome that we could use him as an audience when we wanted to be outrageous, when we wanted to rehash old stories that only we laughed at. How Velu, the pub owner, never drank, but was in love with Amini, the beautiful hard drinking, hard drinking goddess who had been coming in night after night for years. How when I was crashing on Jerry, I managed to play it really cool for weeks, only to lose it totally in the end. When I bumped into Jerry outside the tiny loo, I looked up and mumbled, I've met your mother once. <laughs> Lavanya and I speculated that Akhil was gay. We even tried to set him up a couple of times, I think. One night we made friends with an Australian boy, Darren, who was swarming with studs and had a Zapatista t-shirt. Akhil and Darren were all over each other. I have a hazy memory of standing outside Wikis after Velu, the teetotaler pub owner had personally escorted us out. Lavanya was looking for her bike keys and I was smoking. We had decided that Akhil would take Darren home because he was too drunk to go back to his PG. Akhil was giggling and leaning on Darren who was taller by several inches. I saw Akhil trace Darren's nipples through his thin Zapatista t-shirt. The next day, Lavanya called me, alternately whooping with laughter and crying. She had so sobered up on the dark way home, having lost Akhil and Darren several times for short worrying bursts. At home, she had let them in quietly without waking her parents and fallen into her bed. In the morning, her mother and father were very severe after the chaste and sober Darren had left. The previous night, while the siblings slept. Darren had woken up, stripped, and for some inexplicable reason, walked out of Akhil's bedroom into the parents. Hearing strange noises in their bathroom, the parents woke to the astonishing sight of a stark naked white boy peeing lavishly into their commode. Lavanya and Akhil and I went to Wikis, and in the weeks that followed, Lavanya met someone, I met two someones. Akhil got late, Darren got late, Darren said he was bi. We introduced him to a boy we thought was gay. He wasn't, but his friend was. I stopped drinking. <laughs> we went to Wikis. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, 
Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to sh sort of show off the anthology from out of print that came out at the end of last year, because in fact, uh, at JLF in this bio, um, I think uh, it's this that's been showcased. So a uh, yay to this wonderful anthology. And I'll just read very quickly since I already read from one of my stories, just from the introduction to this, it's the conclusion actually to the introduction. And I say, to what extent does shared geography and culture create distinct commonalities? This was one of the critical questions that inspired me when the magazine was envisaged. The out of print knowledge base built over the last 10 years explores the short story form emerging from the subcontinent. Indeed, it portrays the idea of this united space a virtual subcontinental geography as a network of writing that crosses political boundaries, gender divisions, and examines prejudices and anxieties, both individual and collective. So that's the anthology with full of wonderful stories by wonderful writers, and we wish we could have included more and had context create a second volume. But uh, you know, hey, life goes on. Thank you, all of you. Uh, you were wonderful. It was wonderful to talk about the short story and wonderful to really explore the way in which you explore your worlds. Thank you very much. Thank you, JLF. Thank you, Anushka, Nisha, Paul, Sonal, and Indira for that truly inspiring conversation. And thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. Please stay logged on to continue to watch with us the series of exciting sessions featuring a stellar list of speakers that has been specially curated for you. Hope to see you in the next session. Mm -hmm.